Today, my brethren, we will continue our lesson on the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Today, we shall read from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 13. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, and verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. So continuing in this series of lessons, my dear brethren, concerning the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, having described beforehand how the mysteries are revealed in the 13th chapter, the, the sower, etc., what we talked about. Then we talked about the mysteries of God. And the first was the mystery of God and Father in Christ, which is described very nice, very easily as the mystery of godliness, which is great that God came in the flesh. The Word of God became flesh and walked full of grace and truth among men, he came to reveal the heavenly things, to show a new doctrine, the gospel, which is spirit and life, and to deliver man who was righteously captured by the devil and Satan because of his sins, to set him free and to bring him into the absolute freedom of the Holy Spirit. A mystery that has been hidden, that has been predestined in the heart of God before the foundation of the world, but it was hidden from man because there was no chance for man to be saved on his own as he has been created lower than the, than the angels. And Satan, being an uh, overshadowing cherub, very easily deceived even the elect. But God did not create man, neither for perdition nor for misery in this life. God created man for eternal life and for happiness and blessing within this world. And he had appointed this land, this way of salvation, forgive me, through Jesus Christ. Man, Christ Jesus, the only person who is God and at the same time man. And this mystery is contained in that being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. He didn't, it wasn't considered robbery to him, but he made himself of no reputation he emptied himself from his glory. He took on the form of a bondservant. He became just like man. And as he came in the likeness of man, he humbled himself to the point of death, death even of the cross. And up there on the cross of Calvary, remaining holy and sinless, he crushed the head of the devil without sinning, by not sinning. The second Adam was not deceived though the first Adam who was created in Edom was deceived very easily by the devil. The second mystery of God is the mystery of the will of God, where God, certainly through Jesus Christ, decided to, to collect everything, the heavenly and the earthly things, under Him. That is, to bring the heavens to earth and also to give the chance to the heaven, to the earth, to go up to heaven. And this happened by the Holy Spirit when Christ baptized in the Holy Spirit, firstly in the day of the Pentecost. The 120 that were gathered there in the upper room 
and they were waiting for the Holy Spirit, and whoever after that believed according to the will of God, God gave him the promise of the Father, that is, the power of the Holy Spirit, so that man, by speaking in unknown tongues, can build himself up, and at the same time, with the power of the Holy Spirit, he can become a witness of Jesus Christ and the whole world, the man of God, but at the same time, he can enjoy the guidance and the, and the government of the Holy Spirit. Today we'll deal with the third mystery of God, which is the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is a unique person as well. It is a person, and it is nothing more than the bride, grew, the bride of Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. And as it is written, the glory of the husband is his wife, the glory of man is his wife, so also the glory of Jesus Christ is his wife. And even more, it is written that from the beginning, man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall cling to his wife, and they shall, those two shall become one. And the Apostle Paul says in the epistle to the Ephesians, he says, I say this, concerning Christ and the church. It is a great mystery. This is the wedding, the marriage. Uh, this is something that wasn't discovered by men, marriage, but it was founded by God Himself. And no one can destroy the marriage, even though the devil tries and attempts to destroy the ma marriage. God is the one who supports and, and continues to support marriage. And the wedding of the Lamb will take place up in heaven as a completion of this, uh, this, this tradition when God the Father will perform the marriage of Christ with His church. So the church is an only, it's a unique person and a great mystery upon the earth. I'm declaring a great mystery to you, the Apostle Paul says. We shall not all sleep, we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. At the last trumpet, and the last trumpet, when Christ will come to take up His church, when the period of grace shall come to an end, and the resurrection of the dead will take place, as it is also described in the Creed, He says, I await for the resurrection of the dead, and those who are dead in Christ shall be raised first, then we who are alive, as many of us as remain, shall be snatched up, caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So this church of Christ, which has been appointed by God to cover the gap that is found in heaven, which are the mansions that you find in the house of the Father of Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, it has been appointed that this church dwell and reign forever and ever throughout eternity up in heaven. And the, and the Apostle John says, we do not know what we shall be, but one thing we do know is that we'll, we will be just like Christ, <coughs> similar to Him. And everything begins from the moment that man accepts, believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Whoever has accepted Jesus Christ, John says in his Gospel, to them God has given them authority to become children of God. Children of God, heirs of God. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if, of course, they continue until the end, remain steadfast in the Word, as it is written, whoever is found standing till the end shall be saved. So for this church, as we described very quickly, this unique person which God creates through Jesus Christ, through people that are sinful, that are bound by desires of sin, of ambitions, that are bound within this world, 
And from the moment that every person, because the invitation and the calling is personal, as soon as they accept Jesus Christ, God shows them Jesus Christ. Man accepts Jesus Christ. Man calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. And as it is written, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he is saved. This person is saved. And what does this mean? It means that he has been taken from darkness, the darkness of the devil, the darkness of this world, into the eternal light of God. He is transferred from the lie into the truth. He is taken from the road to perdition into the path of truth. He is taken from death into eternal life. And we thank God very much for this because Jesus Christ, my dear brethren, is the Lord of all hosts. And it is, this is not done with human creation or thought, but it, is, it happens only by the Holy Spirit. And the first revelation that is shown in the Bible for the church is in Zechariah the prophet when God shows him a vision I'd like to go to the prophet Zechariah together chapter 4 and verse 1 the prophet Zechariah 4.1 Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking. And there is a lampstand of solid gold. This is the church of Christ. So with a vision before Christ, God reveals the church to Zechariah. And it, there is a bowl on top of it. And on the stand are seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these things, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these things are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Jerobabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And this is the great secret and mystery for the creation of the church, which doesn't occur through human strength, nor through human power. It happens only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit. And my beloved brethren, the, the disciples, a short time before the ascension of the Lord, they asked Him, Now, do you now restore the kingdom for Israel? And Jesus answered and said, It is not for you to know the times and seasons, but for you it is for you to continue in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, when the Holy Spirit will descend upon you, and then you will become my witnesses. So the disciples believed. They listened to Him. They believed. They heard Him. They accepted the, the Word of God. And for ten days after the ascension, they continued in the upper room praying. And on the, 11th, on the tenth day, the power of the Holy Spirit came down upon them. They were all filled in the Holy Spirit and spoke in unknown tongues and prophesied the great wonders of the Lord. And so everyone who was around them heard that which happened up there in the upper room. Other people reproached them. They said, oh, they probably are drunk. Other people said, but we can hear them speaking in our own dialect and they speak the words of God. And then it is when the Apostle Peter came out of the upper room, he preached to them, and on that day, 3,000 people were saved who were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit unto the remission of sins. And thus, they also received guidance that unto those who believe, God has given them a promise 
to receive through Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit of God. And truly the first apostolic church and the first apostolic church, they all received the Holy Spirit. And thus this great miracle took place of the creation of the church throughout the whole world. The gospel was preached in the whole world that was known back then, of course, not by strength nor by might, but by the Holy Spirit of God, as our Lord says. So that in a very few years, within 40 years, that is, after th from 33 until 470 AD, the whole world knew about Jesus Christ, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and about the eternal life that God decided to give to man. And indeed, we have to take into account that the preaching of the gospel wasn't a simple, uh, simple simple thing because it was uh, directed to people who were idolaters, people who had grown up in idolatry, which was impossible for them to accept and believe the words of the Apostle Paul, a simple man of God. But the preaching of the gospel, my dear brethren, does not come from man because if it's by man, it's just a lecture. The preaching of the gospel must be done by God Himself through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit because the main characteristic of the Church of God is that it is the body of Christ. That the people who are saved are the members of the body of Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ mentioned first time concerning the Church when He asked His disciples, Who do the people say that I am the Son of Man? And they answered, people say that you are Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. They hid or they did not just tell him that there were so many bad things that people were saying concerning Jesus Christ, that he is Beelzebub, the ruler of, of demons, etc., etc., and that he performs miracles by Beelzebub. But the question was not truly directed to what people say because God doesn't care what people say about him. Christ cares about what you the believer says about him, his disciples. And for that reason, he continues and says, But what do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the Apostle Peter, Simon back then, said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is a mystery. This is the mystery of the Church of Christ. And the Lord said, Simon Barjona, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. No man revealed this to you, but my Heavenly Father revealed this to you. Because no person can approach Christ unless he is not drawn by God, first of all. And God does not lead anyone unto salvation except to Christ. Because no one else can save except Christ. You see, my dear brethren, that the grace of God, because we are saved by grace, the grace of God is for us to know the one that He sent, Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of the living God. And this is the truth. How easily can a person accept that Jesus from Nazareth that was born at one time, what's a question mark, was He born? Was he not born in the wisdom of man? He was born in Bethlehem, they say. And he grew up in Nazareth, uh, a supposed son of Mo Joseph and Mary, having uh, four brothers and at least some sisters, that this man is the incarnation of the Word of God? It's difficult to comprehend. It's difficult to be comprehended by the Jews back then priests, scribes, chief priests, Pharisees, for whom this was an offense. For that time back then, it was also difficult for the idolaters, the ethnics. That resurrection was foolishness for them back then. For the Jews, it was an offense, and for the Greeks, it was foolishness, the gospel of Christ. And even more, when it was preached, to the to the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers of the Athenians, 
The Epicureans were those who were materialistic, and the Stoics were those who believed in all of God, the Pantheon. When they preached to him, the Epicureans mocked him, and the Stoics more noble, they said, oh, okay, you'll repeat this again one time. They couldn't accept it back then, and they can't accept it today, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Recently I read, recently, uh, the statements of some great financial financialists in the States who said there are 30,000, 30 million dumb Americans who believe that the universe was created in, uh, in th six days, and there are 130 million Americans that are so clever that laugh at this. It is difficult for man. And I dare say, it's not difficult, but impossible for man to accept that God Almighty became man. It is difficult for them. But this difficulty is a reality. It becomes a reality. It becomes easy when God acts in the heart of man. And man, with the simplicity of his faith, accepts God's suggestion. He turns his eyes to Christ. Because there is the natural faith, where man lives in a natural faith in our world. He goes up on the plane because he believes that it won't crash. He gets in an elevator because he believes that he will reach the seventh floor. Um, he goes in the bus because he believes that the driver will not crash. He lives in a natural faith. And, the, and man, who does not have this natural faith, has psychological problems. They fear their hypochondriac, they fear sorrow, they, they, they fear this and that, they have depression. So man lives in a natural faith. And God comes now and has the faith that saves, offers the faith of saves in this natural faith. And he tells him, can you believe that God loved mankind so much so that he did not spare his only begotten son and he sent him to earth? And even more so that he may become a curse upon the cross of Calvary, so that he may gather the sins of all men, so that man may live in the end. Can you believe in the love of God? That God is love? Can you believe what God Himself says? That I have loved you with eternal love, and I have drawn you with mercy. And people say, what God? A few. Amen. Enough especially atheism, growing nowadays. It has surpassed, it is 50% of the world's population. 50% of the world's population are atheists. They say we are atheists. I cannot believe in any religion. I can't believe that all these things are a creation of God, and everyone has his own philosophy, opinion, and thought. Someone else believes in the Big Bang, someone else believes in this and that or the other. Everyone has his own opinion. But God... Is asking, can you believe this? And not only does he ask, but he acts in the life of man. Because whoever of us are here in this church right now, the Church of Christ, and we'll see how we came here, we did not come neither through our wisdom, neither because of our understanding, nor because someone convinced us. We are here because God acted marvelously in our life, and we accepted Christ. So that we may see Christ. And when we did see Him, we heard the voice of Christ. Come to me, you, who labor and are heavily laden, because there is no person within the world that does not labor and is not laden. Not, not, not burdened, but laden. His soul is full of burdens. His eternal man is full of burdens. His life. And Christ calls out and says, Come to me. Who will believe Him now? Who will believe Him and follow Him? Who will accept the preaching of Christ? Says the prophet I saw. But whoever hears and believes, then Christ will give rest to his soul. He will take the, the burdens. He will take the tiredness from him. And He will give him his peace and his eternal life. Glory be to the name of Christ. 
So when man accepts Christ, then the Lord added daily those who were saved to the church. And this church that he mentioned for the first time in what we read before in Peter, when he said, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my heavenly Father. And he continued and said, and I say to you, Peter, that you are Peter, though he was called Simon, the son of Jonah. He changed his name. And why did he change his name? Because he completely changed him. He wasn't Simon Bar-Jonah anymore, but he was Peter, the servant of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And he says, I am Peter. I say that you are Peter. And on this rock, I, Christ, I, Jesus, will build my church. And the church began to be built by Jesus Christ himself upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets of the first apostolic church. And what happened then? The, this great miracle took place. Now, and I want us to see this, we are of the household of God, members of God, my friends, members of the household of God, living stones, being built up to a holy dwelling place. That's, what is the church of God? The church of God, the bridegroom of Christ, is the house of God. And this is a great mystery. I repeat it. The sinful man, sinful people who have known the love of God, who have heard and seen the hand of God that points to Jesus Christ and they draw ne drew near to Him. They called upon His name then. Christ added Him to His church. God showed grace upon them as God showed grace in His sent Christ. Christ showed grace and He shed His blood for their sin. Christ showed grace and He takes the Holy Spirit from heaven and He floods, not the soul and the heart, but the body of the believer. And He makes the body of man a temple of God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells within you? That is, He brings the heavens and the earth together now. The heavens come to earth by the Holy Spirit. And man, the natural man, this natural man who has a, a vessel of dirt within this clay vessel dwells the supreme greatness of the glory of God. By the Holy Spirit, according to the will of God, within Him dwells God Himself, He says, in Him we shall come, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and dwell within Him. All the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead, dwells within this vessel of clay. That thirsts, that hungers, that hurts, that gets sick, that gets old. A great mystery. And all these people come together and they become one. They become one, one between themselves and one with Christ. The bride and Christ, and the bridegroom, head and body. And this church now, this church is the dwelling place of God, the church of God, the living God, the house of God, which is the f pillar and the foundation of the truth. If there is truth in humanity, and I say in the whole world, and I say if there is truth, because the father of lies is the ruler of this world, the devil, who deceives even the elect. The whole world. He is the one who deceives the whole world. With sorcerers, with soothsayers, with astrologers, with scientists, fake scientists, because the true science agrees with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. A small example I'll tell you now as a parenthesis here. A few years ago they said that the stars were 5,000. 
The word of God said that the stars are like the sand, like the like the sand on the shore of the sea, and they laughed at it. They mocked at it. A few years ago, they would they they wanted to hang Copernicus because he said that the Earth was moving. And the Word of God agrees with science, and the Word of God agrees with true science only. But the people who are in the world, who are deceived by the devil, have not even an inch of truth in them. Who has the truth? Only the Church of Christ. Only the Church of Christ that holds the absolute truth. The supreme truth, which is the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the book of our Creator. And so I can say it more, more commonly, the instructions manual. Only the Church of Christ has the truth. Only the Church of Christ is the foundation and also the pillar that cannot be shaken upon which the truth stands. We thank God, my dear brethren. And this church, the house of God. And within this church, we see the Father working. We see Christ working by placing ministries. He sets apostles, he sets prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. These people are not, my beloved brethren, wise in this world, but they are servants. They are not rulers, they are not governors or anything of the sort, they do not order, they are not leaders. But they serve in the Word of God and in prayers. A great mystery, the, the, the office of the church, the ministry of the church. And he takes fishermen that are illiterate and private and he makes them apostles. And he takes edu educated people, the Apostle Paul, and he makes them an apostle. And he takes tax collectors, Matthew, and he makes them apostles. And by his choice, Christ, but according to the will of God, because he does nothing more or less than what God wants, Jesus Christ chooses people. He selects people. And He makes them vessels of choice. People that He will use for His glory. And I repeat once again, my dear brethren, whoever of us are here today, we have not come because people brought us here. We did not come because we are wise and have understanding. We are here because we found grace by God. We have found grace in God and we have met Christ. We found grace in Christ and we have accepted His blood and we have been sanctified and been set free even though we have been rightly, we were righteously captured by the devil. We are here because we found grace in Christ and He regenerated us, or rather the Father regenerated us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Christ baptized us in the Holy Spirit. We are here because the Word of God for us is the Alpha and the Omega by grace. The beginning and the end by grace. We are here even though none of us, not the one, not the least of us, is worthy of, being, of saying our name is written in the book of life. And all the heavens know us. The angels know us. The, seraph, the seraphim, the cherubim, know us by name because Christ took our name and he, and he recorded it up in heaven. And the devil knows us and he gnashes his teeth, he trembles at us. He cannot manage with the church. He strives to bring it down. And his fight is for the church to lose its faith. For the church to lose her sanctification, to lose the word of God, to lose the presence of God. But we thank God because we know in whom we have believed. And we are confident that the one who called us is able to save us, to keep us until the end. We do not believe, we do not hope that we will endure until the end on our own. 
but that Christ who dwells within us will achieve this. Christ saved us. Christ sustains us. And Christ will raise us up again. We thank God, my dear brethren, for this great mystery of the Church of Christ, which has a mission, this church. And the church is, and the mission is for it to preach the gospel throughout the whole world. And the preaching of the gospel, as we said, is done by vessels that Christ places in this church, by gifts that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, gives to the church for the edification, the comfort, and the encouragement of it, and by the activities that He who fills all in all, the Father that is, operates in the church. And let us see now, my dear brethren, what the plan of God is for what follows. Let us read by the epistle from the epistle of the Apostle Paul in the Ephesians. Very carefully, let us read. I'm reading from the epistle to the Ephesians. Chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own has husbands as, as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So the head of the church is Christ, who is also the Savior, the one who preserves the church. But as the church Sub is subject to Christ, first of all, the church must subject, not to people, not to commandments of men and ordinances, not to doctrines of men, not to traditions of men, but to Christ and His gospel, the written word of God. But as the church subject is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. So Christ did not act, my beloved brethren, did not do this great work and sacrifice on the cross of Calvary because He loved His Father and because He was subjected to His Father only, but as eternal God, Creator, He loved His church. With special care and love, Christ takes care of His church. And what do we enjoy here? First of all, we enjoy the love of God the Father. He takes care of us as a good Father. Take care of everything in our life. But at the same time, we enjoy the love of Christ as His church. Christ is the bridegroom. We, you, my brother and sister, are the bride, the bride of Christ. That Christ has loved you so much, and we have to know this, that the love of God, the, the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Within the gospel of Christ are hidden all the secrets and the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But what matters is that the love of Christ, that we must know, surpasses all knowledge. All knowledge and understanding. Wisdom, understanding, it surpasses everything. And the Word of God says now, Just as Christ loved the church, and the result of the love of Christ for the church that has not been created yet, had not been created then, but He is going to create it, He gave Himself up for her, for her that was going to be His wife. He gave Himself up for sinners, therefore. Because the church did not exist then. And the Bible says, well, it's logical for someone to die for a righteous person, but for a sinful man, for a disrespectful and wicked person, only Christ could do it. Only the love of Christ had this amazing result. He died for sinners so that He may create His church. He gave Himself up for her that He might sanctify her. 
He died on the cross. He became a curse. The Father turned His face away from Him. He is the unique person that God turned His face away from so that He may sanctify her. This is His purpose. This is the purpose of Christ. We cannot be sanctified on our own if Christ doesn't sanctify us. And how does Christ sanctify us? With His Word, with His Holy Spirit, and with the activities that He does in our life. Because Christ works, my brethren. And we said on Sunday as well, but what matters is that Christ, the Word of God, the incarnated Word of God, that stands at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us, works in the life of every one of us in, in numerous ways for your sanctification, for my sanctification. Because not, nothing that it defiles will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only a church that is holy, spotless, glorious. Let us see it together. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church with having not a spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish so the sanctification of the church who takes care of the sanctification more personally your sanctification in your life my brother who is responsible of it do not think that you are responsible of it because if it were in our abilities, or rather if it was our responsibility, then we'd just mess up, all of us. We are wretched and vile. There is not one righteous person upon the face of the earth. We all stumble in many things. But God has appointed someone, a man of choice, Jesus Christ, that he may tend forever to the sanctification and holiness of the church and yours as well and your family's sanctification and your children's sanctification so therefore by continuing in the church it is guaranteed by God the Father through Jesus Christ that there is the sanctification of God by remaining in the church this is the secret of God remain steadfast and immovable says the word of God by continuing in the church but again, a parenthesis. What church? Not the church that people create, religions, dogmas, but the church that Christ builds and creates. And how will I know what the church that God creates and tends to is? Very easily. Pray, and He will show you. He will show you. Tell Him, Lord, to what church should I go? And because God loves you, so much so that He did not spare His own begotten Son for you, He will send Christ to lead you as it is written. There are a hundred sheep and one was deceived. And it says, what does the good shepherd do? He leaves the ninety-nine and he runs to find that one lost sheep and he finds it. And as soon as he finds it, he brings it in his arms and he says, Come and rejoice with me. I found the lost sheep. Within the church, by continuing in the church, that is, by continuing in the doctrine of the apostles, what is the church? Which is the church? What are the visible things of the church? The church that has ministry through the word of God, the doctrine of the apostles, the breaking of bread, communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ every Sunday. We eat and drink the body and blood of Christ so that Christ may dwell inside us and we in Christ. In fellowship with one another, fellowship of love. Not competitions, but co-working with one result, the preaching of the gospel, the salvation of men, the glory of Christ. Fellowship with one another. Fellowship of holy men. and in prayers.
because one of the main operations of the Church of Christ is prayer. And here we are not diligent. We have to become more diligent as a church. We have to be more diligent in prayers. God will help us in this, and we'll find grace by God. So remaining in the breaking of bread, communion of the apostles, um, fellowship with one another in prayers, Christ will make us grow through these things. Christ will edify us, and He will appoint us as a church that is holy, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that we may enter richly through the gates on that day into the kingdom of heaven. But, before we come to closure, let us read also from the book of Revelation, after we read from Zechariah, even though we did not go into detail because we have no time, let us read from the end of Revelation how the Word of God describes the Church of Christ in chapter, the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that, the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. This is an image of Jesus Christ and not the icons that men create. A young man with blonde beard and blue eyes, and they say they're not ashamed to say that this is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right. And he's just a model of that time. May God have mercy upon us and keep us. Or they take an old man with a ruined beard and they say, This is the Almighty Father, God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, the Creator of the invisible and invisible things. This is the image of Christ. But this is the image of Christ as John sees it in vision. And it says in verse 16, that Christ had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. I'll carry on a bit. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, says Christ. I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Church of Christ is a mystery. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The pastor of the church is a mystery that is not appointed, that is not appointed by man, but Christ himself places him there so that he may bring forward the things that God gives him. So it's not for us to give honor to man because we know that Christ is holding him as a puppet in his hand. Honor and glory goes to God. Because if this person falls away, God will, if this man stands, God will continue to work with him. But if he falls, God will bring someone better in his place. Neither is he a ruler. He is a screwdriver in the hands of a worker. He is the saw in the hands of a carpenter. He is a vessel of choice of Christ. That if he does not remain humble and does not work in the Word of God, say, serve the Word of God, then God will just blow like that and it will be disappeared. So the mystery of the seven stars are the seven angels of the church. And the seven golden lampstands that you saw are the seven churches. The seven churches. And so that we may return, my brethren, to Zechariah to see the revelation that God had given to him in chapters 4, 
the angel says, the lampstand is full of gold, solid gold, with a bowl on top of it, which bowl is full of oil, so that the lampstands may burn, full of mercy of oil, and the oil is the power of the Holy Spirit, because with the whole, without the Holy Spirit, it is not the Church of Christ. It is an assembly, it is a brotherhood, it is a gathering of people that quarrel amongst themselves, that swear at each other, that strive and fight each other, who are worse of themselves. But the Church of Christ is full of the love of God, full of peace, faith, hope, humility. And all these things happen not by strength nor by might, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. A vessel full of oil and seven lamps, which are the f seven, uh, seven lamps, which are uh, that come through the seven, um, the seven gold pipes that go to the golden oil drains that give light to the lampstands. This is the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ, as we said earlier, has an end. And its end is the wedding of the Lamb. Let us see this wedding with Jesus Christ that will take place a short time before the, the second coming, according to the Word of God. Chapter 19, uh, Book of Revelation 19, verse 6. Book of Revelation 19, in verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters in heaven, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. All the angels call out now, the archangels, all of heavens. And let us give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife, the church, has made herself ready. Christ is preparing us, but we are making ourselves ready as well. How is the bridegroom preparing herself? She lets herself go into the hands of Him who is preparing her. She lets herself go with trust into the hands of Him who takes care of her, and then every one of us must leave themselves, let themselves go into the hands of Christ. And then it is written that blessed is the man who hopes in the Lord, and his only hope is Christ. And when do you let go? When you hope that Christ has good plans for you. That He is intending to sanctify you. He is intending to bless you. For that reason, my, he says, my son, do not be discouraged by the training of the Lord. Because whomever he loves, he scourges. And he scourges the son that he receives. So do not be sad because of the things that God permits in your life. No matter whatever is permitted and happens in your life, so long as you are a child of God and your name is written in the book of life, God does these things and God permits them for our sanctification. And this is not kismet. And why is it not kismet? Because it's not, He said so and that's what will happen. It's not like that because He gives you the ability to take advantage of the gentleness of God or otherwise to take advantage of the, suffer the, the strictness of God. It depends on you if you're going to be a good child, if you're going to be a good disciple, and if you're going to be a good servant. If you're not a good child, he'll have to make you a good child. If you are not a good disciple, he will be forced to make you a good disciple. And if you are not a good servant, he will have to make you a good servant. But if you want, if you are able to be a good child, a kind child, a good son, a son that is submitted to the God the Father who will lead you to Christ, if you can, you will be a good disciple because one is our teacher and that is Christ. One is our professor and that is Christ. You can be a good disciple if you are interested in learning what Christ wants from you in your life. 
by continuing in the doctrine of the apostles, the breaking of bread, communion with, with one another in prayers, and you may also be a good servant of Christ if you let the Holy Spirit govern your life, direct your life, and you no longer to be who lives but the grace of Christ that dwells within you. So the wedding of the Lamb came. Lamb came. His wife prepared herself, it says, and up there in heaven, heaven was given to her to be clothed in, in white. Completely white. Fine linen. Clean and bright. For fine linen is the rights of the saints. The saints have rights, my brethren. And the saints and the rights of the saints is the glory of sanctification. We have rights, my brethren. We don't have only obligations in the church. We especially have rights as children of God, as disciples of Christ. Let us claim. He says, Ask and you shall receive, so that your joy may be complete. We are given a great right as children of God. We want your joy to be complete, he says, God says. And many other rights that are the promises of God to men. Whatever is written and promised in the Word of God is your right to claim it and to enjoy it. For God did not call us unto curse, but unto enjoying a blessing. And he says to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This is the truth, my brethren. These are the true sayings of God here. Amen.